Well, I want to welcome everyone that here at Vincennes Online. If you're joining us, hey, let's start with a little game. And uh, on the screen, you're going to see uh, some faces, maybe familiar, but I want you to call out who they are, yell out a little participation, and then what they're known for. Here we go. We'll start with an easy one. Who's this? And what's he known for? Chicken. chicken. That's right. He's a chicken guy. How about this guy? A little harder? Bill Gates. You got it. What's he known for? Microsoft, if you said. Yeah, that's probably about right. Who's this guy here? Oh, and there was like blank stares for me. Kanye West. And then what, what's he known for primarily? Okay, good. I'm glad I didn't hear craziness, right? No, it's rapper, producer. Yeah, a lot of things. Who's this? this is my icon right here as a grown up. Oh, Evil Knievel, I heard. I heard people like get real nostalgic on that one, right? Evil Knievel, what's he known for? He's a stunt, daredevil, right? And then next is this. Who's this? Yeah, Martin Luther King, what's he known for? I have a dream, civil rights. And then last, who is this? Babe Ruth, Salt and Swat, and what's he known for? Baseball, home run hitter, whatever, right? So listen, there are all these folks on the screen, famous, and you know who they are, you know what they're known for, but what if you were up on the screen? And you were presented before a crowd of people that knew you. What would they yell out? They'd know you, but what would they know you for? What would you need to be known for? Yeah, I think in the United States right now, we're just kind of in the middle of this uh, heightened political season. We've become ultra divisive as a nation. Now, I don't know if we're more divisive today than we've been in years past. That's, I think, up for debate. But I know this, that we have expressed our contempt for the opposing candidate, the opposing party, probably like uh, no other generation has before. And these United States are turning into what seems like these divided states. And there is a term that goes along with all of this division. It's called political polarization. And you can read about political polarization on all sorts of blogs and websites that are political science motivated. You're probably like, I'm trying to stay away from that stuff. But one in particular is uh, a blog post called 538. Maybe you've been to this before. It has all sorts of charts and diagrams. And here's one chart about the polarization of parties. Americans really don't like the other party. So if you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, you're on the top part. You have a high view of your political views, but then a very low view and and it's shrinking fast. You can see it's falling off fast of the opposing political party, meaning there's a schism that's going on in our nation that we see the other party as being foolish. We see the other person as having bad ideas to the point where we're saying they're worthless. They're worthless. And when you start counting someone as worthless, that means they don't add any value to the conversation and you're willing to write them off. You're willing to... Well, you're willing to put them just about anywhere you can, even eliminate your opponent if need be. And I think the political polarization that we're seeing is creating all this disunity. But let me just kind of narrow it down because you get out of the nation, you start getting into territories like the church, you start getting into rooms like we're in right now, and you start realizing there's division in this room. There's a lot of diversity here, but we're not always tolerant of one another in the diversity. And let me just give me some silly examples. Like you would all have a different opinion about what the absolute perfect temperature should be in an auditorium, wouldn't you? Every now and then you put it on your feedback card. This is what it is. Let me tell you why, let me tell you why we keep it cold. It's to keep the sermons fresh. That's about the only explanation I have for it. But let's get a little bit more serious because I know of churches that have split apart because of some things that should be a matter of doctrine, but turned into matters of abate. Even things like, is baptism essential for salvation? Now, you would say, well, I think we're all in agreement on that one. The Bible has a clarity about that. But there have been churches that have split apart about that. There's been churches that have split apart about, are we born sinners? Are we born into a sinful world with inclination to sin? You're like, I've never thought about it. Well, there have been churches that have thought about it and so have overly thought about it that that has become a pinch point for them and the church has split and has become divided. Now, let me give you a little motto that's come out of the restoration movement. This is why I love our roots as a movement, 200 years ago, the Restoration Movement was founded in saying, hey, listen, this denominationalism is really divisionism, and we need to get back to the call of the scriptures in Acts chapter 2, and that's really our call, and this little motto came out of it, in essentials, unity, in opinions, liberty, in all things, love. I love that. But as much as I love it, I don't always get it right because the greatest disunity is not in the United States, the divided states. It's not in the church that we're a part of. It's really right here in me. It's really right here in me. So last week, my son came home and he had a conversation with an adult. And apparently through that conversation, he is so perceptive, by the way, beware of my kids. He had discovered through their language and their temperament of him that they must not like me. And so he came home and said, hey, dad, I met someone who doesn't like you. And he couldn't believe that. He was bewildered by it. And my wife stepped in. She said, you know, 
son, there's a lot of people that don't like your father. And I'm like, okay, easy, <laughs> easy, easy. Be cool, be cool, be cool, sweetheart, be cool. And, you know, we had this kind of dialogue with him. And so I just basically told him, I, I kind of pointed out the things that we're trying to work on in these teachings in this series. I said, listen, there's some things about your dad that are not consistent all the time. And so I started pointing out these six things that we're trying to value and, and hold to our core and commit ourselves during this heightened political season. Like remember in our identity, we're Christians first, behave with civility, demonstrate dignity, humility and unity and charity. And I'm like, son, listen, your dad can do a thousand things right, but if he does 10 things wrong, some people just remember the 10 things that he did wrong. Sometimes people have seen me at my very best and they think I'm an angel. Some people have seen my very worst and they think I'm Satan himself. Listen, there's going to be some people that just don't like me because they don't like me. They're not going to like you, but you have to live up to this just like I have to live up to this. And we don't always get that right. That's true, isn't it? We don't always, we don't always get this right. And when we get it wrong, we really become known for the wrong thing. Even though it may not be a true representation of who we are at the core, it's who we are to them. And what I was really trying to teach my kid was, Hey, when I remember identity, when I behave with civility and demonstrate dignity and humility and unity and charity, when I'm, when I'm really a Christ follower and get this right, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a light to this world and this darkness. But when I get this wrong, I am, I'm a pit of despair for some people. And I give Christ a bad name. I give our family a bad name. I give myself a bad name. And really what I was teaching that kid that day was the reason why I'm not consistent on this stuff is because there are times in my life where I want what I want when I want it. And I don't care who I leave in my wake. I'll stretch the truth if it needs to. Hey, claim a falsehood as a fact. Fight with friends, argue with coworkers just to get my way or at least the last word in. How about you? Oh, don't look at me like I'm the only one. <laughs> I'm bearing my heart here and you're looking at me like, he's that bad, seriously? <laughs> look at me like my wife looks at me. I think there are times when we so badly want a candidate to win, so much want a party to pull off the victory, so badly want a pop proposition to pass through an election that we will, we will compromise our integrity. We will, man, we will, we will lay aside our Christian values. We will act like anybody but Christ himself to make the persuasion, push the argument forward, push the falsehood story fast. Push aside our identity, our civility, our dignity, our humility, our unity, and our love for others. And we will forget our call that Christ has called us to, to be known for love rather than contempt. To be known for compassion rather than hatred. Well, come on, quit looking at me like this. How do you treat a friend when they come to you about your candidate that you're all in for, and they come to you with a falsehood? It's not factual. It's a falsehood. It's a known fact. It's a known fact that it's false. How do, you, how do you handle that conversation? Do you beat him over the head or you say, hey, listen, friend, let me respect you with truth and love? Oh, no, no, how about this one? How about when the news media reports something that is a negative story about the candidate or political party that you have invested in and there is a full truth to it, do you come unglued? Do you sneer at the reporter, start to hate the channel, start to have your whole house turn into a, a blazing fire of anger? Or do you show self-restraint and say, it's no big deal, it's only politics? Hey, what if there was an answer to the division that we see in our country, in churches, in our own heart? What if there was an answer to this? And you're like, well, there is an answer. I know a lot of you are like, well, there's an answer. It's unity. If we could just be United States versus the divided states. But let me just tell you that uniformity is just commonality and uniformity is not the same as unity. I've been on enough sports teams to tell you that. Like we've all dressed in our same uniforms, headed in the same direction towards the same goal line, been in the same huddle or hung out in the same dugout. And there was no more unity there. It was just uniformity, commonality, sameness. There wasn't love. There, there was backbiting, there was jealousy, covetousness. Friends, those things don't add up to unity. It was just an outside show for the externals. We're all in uniform here. We all play on the same team. But internally, if they got into the guts of the system, they'd recognize you boys don't have anything in common. As a matter of fact, it looks like you hate one another here. Now, uniformity is not the same as unity itself. So what's the answer? Not unity. When Christ talks of us, his bride, when the Bible, New Testament in particular, talks about you and I, 
it really sets us up as the hope of the world. Did you know that? You, you are the hope of the world. And the solution that God has to the schism that we see in politics, in our nation, in our churches, and in our own life, the hope that God has left here on earth is you and it is me. How does that make you feel? It's you and it's, and it's me. And see, this hate that we're experiencing, maybe at home, maybe at the workplace, maybe in our nation, the answer to all this hate is the church. Friends, the church isn't a place. The church is a group of people. The church is you all, and you are the hope of the world. You are to be Christ to somebody. Jesus taught us that the most defining character trait that the church should provide for the world to see is the character trait of charity. It's an old word that is used to say love. In John chapter 13, Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet. He has 12 of his closest friends there. Jesus is just moments away from heading to the cross to be crucified. But before he does, he has a last dinner with them and the 12 are around them and they're having this bonding time. But then Jesus predicts some things in a couple of the disciples. And he says, listen, I know from the outside, we all look unified, but interiorly, some of you are divided of heart. And Judas, you're going to betray me in just a little bit. And Peter, you're going to deny that you ever knew me in a little bit. And Jesus is saying this to his disciples as 12, and he's pointing them out like, this is gonna happen, fellas. There's gonna be disunity. There's gonna be disruption amongst you. And then he has this teaching. Here's the teaching that comes on the heels of what Jesus just says. He says, a new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another by, by this, by loving one another, like in these moments of hardship and circumstances and pain and trial, by doing this, when you should be disunified by loving each other, by this, everyone, everyone, who's everyone? <laughs> Everyone's everyone. Well, no, that you are my disciples if you love one another. And he looks at them and he says, fellas, listen, you're gonna have a lot of reason to hate Judas. You're gonna have a lot of reason to wanna just stab uh, Peter in the back here. You're gonna have a lot of reason to have revenge feelings and, and feelings of, of betrayal and aloneness, but don't let all that get the better of you. Actually, don't fall into that. You need to love one another and you can pull this off because I've shown you how to love a diverse, intolerant group. And Jesus teaches them what I am teaching you today. This very simple phrase that there will be unity when you choose charity, when you choose love. Friend, there can be unity in this nation, in this world, in your household, in your life, in your own heart when you choose charity, when you choose love, when you just say, make the decision, I am going to love today. Because when the world sees this, what do you think comes to their mind? Like when they see Christians, when they see Christian, when they see this congregation on display, what do you think comes to their mind? What do you think Christ's followers are known for? I, I would bet to say this, that Christians are becoming known for what they're against than what they're for these days. As a matter of fact, I think there's surveys that back that up. Barna, who is a research studyist, uh, their president named David Kinneman, I heard him speak last week. He had talked about a survey they conducted for non-Christians that said, would you help us understand what you believe Christians are for, how you know them. Can I tell you the number one answer was this? Judgmental attitude. You will know we are Christians by our judgmental attitude. No, that's not how the song goes. That's not even how the tune goes. I don't even know. It's not in line with what Jesus said. Answer number two on the list. Pushy politics. They will know we are Christians by our pushy politics. Answer three, hip, hypocrisy. They will know we are Christians by our hypocrisy. Number four, moral arrogancy. They will know we are Christians by our moral arrogancy. Love, love didn't even make the top 10. And yet Jesus says, of all the things that you should be known for, the thing that you should be known for is love. And so the boiled down sentence that came out of that study was this. Non-Christians don't dislike the message of Jesus. They just dislike his messengers. Y'all, that's us. Like, reputation ain't good. And today, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to make this commitment to strive for unity, but to really start it with charity, that there'll be unity when you decide and choose love. And let me tell you what happens. Well, let me tell you why it's so important. If we don't get this right, if we don't, as a church, if we don't get this right, we will ruin our reputation. We will weaken our witness. And here is what worse. We will be known as Christians who have just nothing but contempt 
not compassion. You're going, well, contempt. You said that a couple times. What does that even mean, contempt? Let me tell you what contempt is. It is a mixture of anger and disgust. Does that, do those two feelings come together when you think about politics, when you think about the opposing party, when you think about someone that hands you things that are not factual, but they're claiming as facts against your candidate, your political ideology, that there's a mixture of bitterness and disgust. And what happens is contempt starts to raise its ugly head out of us and it comes out as venom towards them. Here's how sometimes contempt comes out. It comes out in that snooty sigh that you deliver. You know what I'm talking about? Someone gives you their opinion, you just go, oh, that hit, didn't it? You know that. You know the snooty sigh. Like, I'm not even dealing with this. You're not even worth dealing with it. You don't, you're not even worth giving my time to, to answer. No. That's, that's contempt that's raised up. Or that, you know, just sarcastic social media meme or post that you put out there. They're like, I'm going to show them. I'm going to really hit them over the head with this one. You feel good about it, but it's just mixed with hatred, vinegar, and venom. Sometimes it just comes out in the argument, in the workplace. There's like a a beat down in the break room. For whatever reason, you just lost your cool, man. You just had to just verbally attack someone's character even though they were staying on content of their argument and you just wrecked them. Got three questions for you that I hope you can just kind of answer in your own heart for a moment. Who have you been harsh to lately? Who have you been harsh to lately? What was the reason? Third most penetrating question, was it worth it? I can't, I can't see a place where you say, yeah, totally worth it. And when contempt leaps out of us, it's like this in, in, indication that, that something's wrong right here. That there's a division of the heart. Not a division of what's around me. It's, it's a division of the heart. It's like that smoke detector that goes off in the house when there's a fire. It's blaring the alarm. Listen, the smoke detector's not the problem. The fire's the problem. And you can blame the smoke detector all day long, but it's telling you, it's just warning you that there is a problem. And contempt, when it leaps out of us, is just warning us there's a problem right here. It's the warning sign that we've got something to miss in our heart. When you're seeing the opposition as the enemy and you're hoping nothing but scorn and shame on them, friends, that's a warning that something's not right in your heart. The values of Christ are not being grown. Something else is. And let me just ask you this question. When did it become okay to hate? When did that start in our lives? You see, followers of Jesus are not to be known for contempt or for hate. Followers of Jesus are to be known for love. And early in Jesus' ministry, he says, I and my father are gonna look intensely into your heart. We're not gonna look at this superficial stuff that you do. You can fake your actions. I'm gonna look at your motives. I'm gonna look at your heart. And Jesus had this teaching in Matthew chapter five, this way about the intent of our heart as it relates to contempt. Have you heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He goes on again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And Jesus teaching is this, hey, you all have enough self-restraint. You have enough self-governance to not go out and murder someone. Oh, good job, guys. Everyone nearly has that kind of self-restraint. But do you have the spiritual restraint to show compassion rather than contempt when you're squeezed, when you're pinched, when you're in argument or debate? See, Jesus is really saying, listen, that your anger is really the same thing that's going on in your heart that's producing that anger is the same thing that can produce that murder. And the more you harbor that, the worse it's gonna get in you. And I didn't call you to be known for your anger. I didn't call you to be known for your contempt. I called you to be known for your compassion and for your love. That should be the hallmark of your interactions. And friends, can I give you what is beyond this? I mean, Jesus is alluding to this. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we display this attitude of contempt, this behavioralism of contempt. And here, here's why because it runs contrary to the gift that he has provided in your life. 
You see, God has given us all a gift as believers. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've committed your life to him, he's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift of the Holy Spirit, like any good gift, should bring value and blessing to your life. It should bring one of, or both of those two things to your life. Value and blessing. And that Holy Spirit brings us the value and blessing of being able to love unconditionally people who are different than us. So there's gonna be a lot of people who are different than us. It's a supernatural ability to love others unconditionally. And that's the ability that God gives to you when you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have this within you. But anytime we show contempt, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And it actually, it actually pushes him aside and pulls you forward. And so unity starts when you choose charity first. These divided states can become these United States. That household of division that you're in right can become a household of unity if you decide to choose love. That parent-child relationship that's fractured right now, if you choose love, there can be the start to unity. Friends, it's possible in your political realm, the people that you speak politics to and you get angered at, it's possible to disagree politically and love unconditionally. It's possible to put love over politics right now. It's possible to do this. And I just, I just want to draw you, your attention to how Jesus did this because in his 12, in his group of friends that he had for three and a half years, they did everything together, every single thing together. And they stayed pretty unified, even to the core internally, not just externally, but there were two guys that were polar opposites politically. Polar opposites. We don't know much about this guy, but there's a guy named Simon the Zealot. Not Simon Peter, Simon the Zealot. That's how he's always referred to by the gospel writers, Simon the Zealot. And that word zealot, means that he was a part of a political fraction of, of, of Rome where he said, I want to overthrow the government. He carried a gun or a sword on his hip. He would have carried a gun today. He would have carried a sword on his hip. He was looking for a battle. He was looking to fight somebody. He was looking to overthrow the government and conspiracy theories all day long. And then there's Matthew, the polar opposite of Simon the Zealot. Matthew's like on the side of Rome. He says, no, no, we need to be good Roman citizens because I'm a tax collector. I work for the IRS and that's just how we need to behave. Whatever the Roman government says we need to do, we need to follow along with it. They, they know best. Guys, those could, they, they could be polar opposites politically further than those two guys. But yet you never hear about their, their schisms or you never hear about the, the, the faction that's in that group at all because they were able to look at themselves who disagree politically and still love each other unconditionally. I, I've read that these two on screen here, Antin Scalia and, and Bear Ginsburg, that they were, they were close friends. Their families used to vacation with one another. But boy, they couldn't be more polar opposite politically. And then these two guys, uh, what, do you, what do you think Bush is saying there? Hey, check out Scalia over there. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Those two. But that may be, Bush says about Clinton, he's a brother from a different mother. They're like able to lay aside their politics and get along. If the, if, if that, those two groups can do that, why can't you do that? And you have this supernatural gift of love through the Holy Spirit in you. So think just for a moment. Who do you disagree with politically and need to start loving unconditionally right now? Now, who is that? It could be that friend that's on social media that you haven't seen in a long time, but man, every time you put something out there, they lob something in, then you decide to lob something back. It could be a spouse, friend at work, a parent. I mean, the apostle Paul wrote to a congregation that met in the city of Ephesus, and he wrote this little letter to them, and it's found in a New Testament portion of our Bible. It's titled Ephesians. I want you to turn with there, if you would please, in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's one on the chair rack in front of you. It's page 948. And Paul is teaching a group of young Christians. You might even say that they are immature in the faith. And because they have a, a, an immaturity in them, they don't want to grow in Christ. They want what they want, when they want it, as they want it, and it's cre created a division for them. And Paul says, you need to get back to loving. And when you get back to loving, you'll start to get back to finding some unity. In Ephesians chapter four, verse one. Paul starts out, and, and just mind you, he, he is a prisoner. He knows what it's like to be in jail, so he starts with prison language because that's on his mind. Can't escape it. As a prisoner for the Lord, meaning I've been chained to Christ. I love that. I'm captive by Christ. He says, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Ephesians 1, or sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 now. And note the characteristics now that he says we should be called to. 
Be completely humble. You can't do that unless there's love. And gentle, can't do that unless there's love. Be patient, can't do that unless there's great love. Bearing with one another in love. You know what that word bearing means? Tolerant. For some of you, that's a, a kind of a, a filthy word. To be tolerant of somebody else who's different than me. He's saying, listen, there's gonna be diversity amongst you. You need to be tolerant to one another and have unity. And unity is only gonna be gained when there is charity. Look at verse three. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I love what Paul does here. He talks about love. He talks about the hallmarks of love. He talks about the characteristics of love that should be found in us without saying love. And then he says, these are the things that should bind us together in the faith. There's one body. That's called the church. That's us. One spirit. That's God's Holy Spirit. As you were called to one hope. That's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus who were called. And there is one Lord, Jesus, one faith, faith in him, one baptism, baptism into Christ, one God, one father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And that is one of the most powerful pieces of scripture that says we are unified, not because of what we hold on to together. We are unified because we love the same thing together, Jesus. And when we love Christ, Christ will change us and we'll have the capacity to love others and live out those two great commandments, love God and love people. And friends, what I have found is love is the greatest unifier, the most powerful unifier on the face of the earth. That's why Jesus taught about that subject of love so often. That's why the apostle Paul said things so lofty like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse one, let love be your highest goal. But sadly, my life is not always living on that goal. Not always living on that goal. I'm not always aiming for that target. Not always aiming for that target in conversation. There's a four-letter word that is going to ensure unity. It is L-O-V-E. But there is also a four-letter word that I use often that discredits and ruins unity. You know what it is? M-A-T-T. And when I get in the way of it, things always go south. When I step in, I want what I want. When I want it, that's when disunity begins. That's when problems arise. And the Apostle Paul, he wrote this famous piece of scripture that we oftentimes hear at weddings, but that's not why he wrote it. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse one says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, have an earthly language and a lofty heavenly language, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, I can be the best speech presenter there has ever been, the best orator that the world has ever known. I can speak in lofty language, but if I don't have love, what's it for? He goes on to say, if I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom the mysteries of all knowledge. Like if I had the highest IQ, the smartest guy in the room, I had so many degrees that you just call me a thermometer. Good line, that's a good line. <laughs> and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Like I can, I can raise people back from the dead, but I, if I don't do it in love, I am nothing. And he goes on to say, I can give everything to the poor. And we'd say that would be good, but people have all sorts of motives as why they give money, don't they? even sacrifice. I can be a martyr for, for the cause. I could boast about it. And even if I didn't love, but if I didn't love others, what would I have gained? What do I gain? Let's just say that loud. Gained nothing. I'd be a big fat zero in this one. The fact is I, I don't love very well. I mean, that's the truth about me. I don't love very well. How about, how about you? Where do you put yourself on the scale? How, how well do you love? Because love isn't always my highest goal. It, it, it's, not always, it's not always the top that I'm looking for. Like I get in a heated argument, I'm not looking to love, I'm looking to win. You know, we're gonna play a sport together, not looking to love you in the moment, looking to win. It's not a lot of, not a lot of areas that I'm really searching, seeking for love. And, and, and you can have a little litmus test in your life right now. Because in Philippians chapter two, Jesus, we're being told rather, the apostle Paul tells us about who Jesus is, that he's this humble figure that lays down his life when he doesn't have to. And here's what he says, that Jesus Christ considered others better than himself. The litmus test is, how do you do that? Do you do that? Consider others better than yourself. Or are you the smartest person in the room? Or do you have all the answers? Or is it only your way and your ideas about the direction the country should go? Or is it only your political ideologies? Do you, can, do you even give it even consideration? Or are you in moments of contempt where you just, I'm not even listening, I'm not even gonna treat you as a human right now. How well do you do it? Let me tell you how Jesus did. When everyone said, nope, 
These little kids are a problem. These little kids, you shouldn't be around them. Jesus, you have an agenda. Jesus, you have a schedule. Jesus, it wouldn't be right for you to be seen with such little kids. I mean, that's not what a holy teacher of God should do. Jesus says, would you just let the little kids come to me? Just, I, I got time for them. I mean, I got all the time in the world right now for these kids, so lay off me. Or how about when the pious religious leaders of his day ridiculed him because he befriended prostitutes and tax collectors and notorious sinners. He didn't let their ridicule stop him from loving them, did he? He didn't go, oh, you're, you know what, guys? I am, I'm getting a bad rep for this. I should stop talking to prostitutes. I should stop talking to tax collectors. You're right. I'm going to heed your advice. I'm going to take your warning. I should stop being this kind of, of leader. No, no, Jesus pressed in and he didn't consider himself better than and he loved them. Friends, think about, think about this world for a moment. Of all the religions in this world, did you know it's only Christianity that is to be known for its love? It sets such a high value on love. That's why Jesus said, everyone will know. Everyone know you are my disciples if you love one another. Like everything you do in this Christian life should have the goal, the, the direction of loving God and loving others. That's what makes Christianity unique. I don't know if you knew that or not. That's what makes you unique is this Holy Spirit that works within you. And when you just say, God, not my will, but yours be done, that supernatural gift to love unconditionally can arise out of you. And I think the reason why we're so divisive today is just, we just, we're just thoughtless, incompassionate, intolerant of others. Like there's views in this room. My grandfather preached three weeks ago on end time prophecy. There's views in this room of end time prophecy that are so divisive. You'd say, no, he's coming back this way. God's coming back this way. You think people who are lost and dying and go to hell care what you're arguing about right now? That's not saving anybody. You know, there's in theological circles and even some of you brought this up. Well, Paul's not the writer of Hebrews. This person might be, we don't know. You think people who are dying and going to hell who are lost, you think they care about who the author of Hebrews is? They need need some hope, friend. And we have all these little debates that we have in Christendom, you know, the style of worship. What's gonna be the temperature of the room? Lost and dying people don't care about that stuff. You do. Or how about this one? We're we're in political season. Does Jesus drive an SUV or a Prius? Heard that one the other day. Heard an argument. Maybe some of you thought about this. Is he an IU fan, a Purdue fan, or a UK fan? He's neither, he is a Notre Dame fan. Everybody knows this. He stands in the end zone like this. And I think the reason why we get into all these little stupid, silly, meaningless debates about stuff, because we don't want to deal with, don't want to deal with just loving each other. We'd rather show contempt than compassion. Here's my challenge today. Because you can do this. You you all who have the Holy Spirit in your life, you can do this. Show love to your opponent. Friends, Jesus said you can love your enemy. You can love someone who is different than you politically. You can love them unconditionally. Who is that opponent in your life? It could be that spouse. It could be that child. It could be that parent. It it could be that coworker or friend. Who do you need to start loving today and showing compassion to rather than contempt to? Jesus said it very boldly. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. Like you will be a chip off the old block. You'll be a chip off the old block if you just start creating peace rather than creating trouble. We need more peacemakers. I mean, more more people to put out fires of anger and bitterness. Christians who strive for unity. Peacemakers who respond with charity rather than contempt. Peacemakers who will refuse to spit venom when opposed. Who will refuse to attack character when the disagreement is about content. Peacemakers who have a gentle hand of restoration to bring unity when there could be and maybe even should be division. When you're a peacemaker, you look to the other and you make peace with them the best way you know how because you are a child of God. You are a chip off the old block and God is the greatest of peacemakers. You know how I know that? Because he has made peace with a fool like me who wants his way when he wants it, as he wants it, who misrepresents his teaching, who oftentimes misrepresents his son, who my own family now fills the ripples of times where I am inconsistent in my faith. And he says, Matt, I'm gonna make peace with you. And he did that. 
He did that at a place called Golgotha, a hill outside of Jerusalem where Jesus Christ went and gave himself up in death so that I could be made alive in Christ. And as Christ rose from the dead, that spirit of resurrection is in me. And friends, that spirit of resurrection that is in me gives me now the ability to love people who are different than me. It gives me the ability to love unconditionally in diversity. That spirit of God is at work within you. If you've given yourself over to Jesus Christ, you know, Romans chapter five, verse one puts it like this. We, we have peace with God because of what we've done. No, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord has done for us. Don't you love that? Jesus Christ saw it fit to come and make peace with you so you can have peace with God. And my question to you is, who needs to have peace with God and is not there yet and can have that peace because you have gone to them and has shown compassion rather than contempt? Who needs that in their life? Who has been your political opponent that you need to start loving unconditionally? Will you pray with me? Father, I know I, we get wound up. I'm looking at folks in here and I'm thinking about conversations we've had about politics and we've done that privately and we're on the same page and we've, we just get so wound up about politics and may we, number one, understand the temporalness of it all. And that there's a lost and dying world there and we need to be the hope to the world and you call us to be that. So may we put all that aside and may we put you first. May we put you first. Forgive me for not doing that as often as I should. Father, we come to you today, and I know there's folks in this room that need to put you first. They've never done it. They believe, but they haven't been baptized. They haven't, they haven't made a commitment to you. May they, may they make that commitment today. There's others that have just kind of uh, just given up on their faith. They've trusted you at one time, but have walked away. I pray, Father, that they will make steps back to you. Visit a pastor today. Make a step of recommitment. Father, may we get this right. We don't want to ruin our reputation. We don't want to weaken our witness. And worse, we don't want to be known for contempt. We want to be known for charity love. May people know that we are Christians by our love. And we pray these things in Christ's name and we all say together, amen.